Hey, deserving listeners, it's time for me to react to your comments from my videos from last week. Let's get to it. I posted a bunch of reaction videos to the Meghan and Harry interview with Oprah, so let's start with that. I don't know, Moon said, if someone in a romantic relationship was pressured to abandon their connections outside of their relationship and pressured to stay indoors constantly, we would be talking about it as an abusive and damaging relationship. Yes. Another point that occurred to me later about the way that Megan described her conditions and the way she was treated and the emotional pressure and the way in which everyone was saying, look, this is how we do it as a group. You need to be like us. Sounds a bit like a cult. Now, there's a lot of definitions of cult and we don't know exactly what happened. We haven't heard. We probably never will hear from the other side because you know, they have a policy about not being completely honest about things for various different reasons. But at the very least, the way that Megan described it, yes, if you just heard the details, you would say, wow, that sounds like an abusive relationship. Or wow, that sounds kind of like a cult, a high control relationship where you aren't allowed to see your friends, you aren't allowed outside of the house, you uh, have to act like everything is fine, you can't say what you want to, everyone is telling you that you have to put up with this and it feels bad. It, it feels like you're being oppressed. It feels like you're being harmed. Again, we don't know what the other people would say if they were allowed to be honest, but at the very least, we can say that Megan described something like that, and it seemed credible from her perspective for sure. Twinkle said, spring must be coming. Dr. Honda is out of the plaid. Well, yes, I'm back in the plaid, but I have short sleeve shirts. When it starts to get warm in Seattle, even though I have the thermostat to the same setting, for some reason, it's just so much more cold or hot in my, in my office. And so it's time for short sleeve shirts. Okay, Virginia said, oof, that part about avoidant attachment that you talked about and a disengaged family really hit hard. I come from an abusive family and it's, a, it's 100% as you describe. Their behavior is polite, but at a deeper level, it's, very, it's really cold. On paper, everything looks good and well, but also everything is kept very shallow. None of us really know each other in the family. Emotional displays or emotional conversations are not welcome and are considered troublesome or even punished. Yes, families are like this sometimes where, and I talked about it in the Megan and, and uh, Harry reaction video, that you'll have a family for various reasons from trauma being passed down where the rules of the family are such that if we go into emotional content, if we go into vulnerability, if we start allowing complaints to come out, if we start actually having real authentic communication, then this whole family is gonna fall apart. That's the rule that they're, fo they're, they're following this rule. A lot of bad family rules are being followed because they're trying to hold on to the little bit of love and attention and connection that they have. And they believe that if they don't follow that rule, then everything's gonna fall apart. And even the most high functioning family will have at least some problematic rules or even some rules where it's a little bit debatable, right? Like on one side of the spectrum, you would say that in a cold family, it's like, man, you just you gotta talk about your feelings more. There's, so people can actually know about what's going on in your heart, you can support each other. On the other end of the, end of the spectrum, if everyone is constantly talking about their feelings without any editing, if they're always complaining, if they're always having a hard time, then what is left to actually have some stability or some, I don't know, just some, some good times. Now, I'm painting it in a certain direction, certainly on that end of the spectrum, you could say, well, a lot of joy would come out as well, a lot of love would come out as well. But that's the sacrifice that the cold family will make. They'll say, well, we know, and either consciously or unconsciously, that we're, we're sacrificing love and connection, but what we're gaining is stability and ongoing connection and ongoing homeostasis and balance based on what we know from our past or the messages we were told. Sometimes these are passed down through seven generations of ideas of that this is the way families are. And in the royal family, there seems to be that pattern for a variety of reasons. Again, I don't know, I'd have to ask them, but from the outside, it certainly looks that way. And so Virginia is talking about, wow, I grew up in a family like that, where everything looked fine. And I felt like 
I was supposed to think everything was fine, but deep down, I knew how the way the family reacted when anyone, including myself, tried to be authentic. And it can be very hard in situations like that. People often develop a lot of anxiety, a lot of distrust of other people. They become very inward, and a lot of damage can happen. Yeah. So good on YouTube says, can you do a video about the effects of not having consistent caregiver in those developmental years? As someone who lived in seven random families before the age of seven, I've always wanted to know more about how that has affected me. I'm reading a book of attachment theory and love it. Yeah, uh, become a patron of the podcast. Uh, a lot of people have said this, that my attachment deep dive series, I think there's six or seven chapters. I think there's 13 hours or something. I don't know, a lot of hours of me uh, talking and lecturing on attachment theory. It's just for patrons of the podcast, though. And I worked on that uh, series of episodes for patrons for months, if not years. And it really, even just making the episodes myself changed my life. So, uh, and I'm, I'm saying that because I often talk about attachment theory, but if you really want to get the full picture, become a patron, listen to those episodes. Anyway, uh, Lancey says, I think a lot of people dismiss Megan's problems because she married rich. Rich or poor, it's just inhumane to have your mental health dismissed like that. Yeah, this, and that doesn't make any sense to me. And I get why people have this idea that, well, you're rich, you're famous. Don't you have it all? Stop complaining. When you understand human nature, you understand that doesn't make any sense. Being rich, being famous is a tiny fraction of what you actually need. You know, the accolades you get, the attention you get, it's, it's a positive. But baseline, 99% of our needs cannot be met through money or at least excessive money and fame. We need love, we need security, we need safety, we need people to understand us, we need attachment security, we need shelter, we need food, we need water, we need a place to sleep, we need sleep, we need you know, our health. Those things can be facilitated by a certain amount of money, but not by excessive money and certainly not fame. If anything, fame actually is, is degrading to, to that. So when people say, like, what is she complaining about? She married into a super rich, famous situation. She's in the royal family. Why would she complain? Uh, that has nothing to do with human needs. <laughs> I mean, it, you're being deprived of of you're feeling very bad about yourself. You feel very isolated. You feel like you're not being accepted by those around you. Do you say, well, at least I'm famous. Like that doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And I wish that people understood that more in the general public as you do, uh, Lancey, because then when famous rich people come out and say that they're really hurting, then we would have a little bit more sympathy. Um, if you're hearing dogs and you're hearing buzzes, it's because the dogs are barking at people on the street <laughs> or chickens at the, at the neighbor's house. And my uh, dryer, uh, clothes dryer, is right on the other side of this wall and it, it has a very loud buzz. And I forgot to turn it off before starting recording, so forgive me, <laughs> but I think it stopped. So let's get back. Actually says, I'm from the UK and we definitely have not moved past racism. I'm a white woman. My partner is mixed black. We've been together nearly a decade and things are getting better, but I still hear some BS stereotypes. Yeah, the, a lot of people, I don't know, but in, a, in the United States anyway, think about racism as, a, as an American thing. You know, we, we think that uh, Americans think America is the greatest place where everything good happens and the only things that good happen around the world happen in the United States, which is silly. And they also think that all the bad things are only happy in the United States because we're very uh, nation-centric, if you are self-centered. Racism is all over the planet. Of course it is. And England or, you know, the UK is, is no different than that at all. Uh, Karen says... I will say that there's there's different history and there's different reports and maybe it's a matter of intensity or the, the flavor of racism might be different in different societies for sure. But uh, I learned this early in life as a Japanese American. I would hear Japanese Americans or Japanese nationals talking racist, horrible racist things about pretty much every other Asian uh, nationality, Korean, Chinese, Vietnamese. 
And I thought, oh, as a, as a person that grew up thinking that, well, Koreans and Japanese, like we got to stick together in the United States. We're, you know, we're the ones being oppressed. Let's stick together. And that's how I felt. And that's how they felt. But to hear about the older people or the people back in the old country, to hear about the racism that went on there is like, oh, I guess racism isn't just an American thing. Anyway, Karen says, when Diana, Princess Diana, had mental health issues, she asked the family for help and Charles gave her books to read. When she asked again, they arranged for a doctor who prescribed medication and she didn't find it very helpful. She finally began to heal when she began to see a therapist and attributed her recovery to that therapy. Dear royal family, get some therapy, please. Agree with you, Karen. And actually, I, I don't know, I'm guessing you're saying that in, um, seriously, Karen, I don't know, but uh, I've often thought that, that the little bit I understand about the royal family and the troubles that they have can all be mitigated, if not completely solved, if they had proper therapy, that all of us go through sim you know, problems when we're growing up and some of us more than others. And what do we do? Well, we go to therapy, we're royal family. But again, if for the royal family to go to therapy, and, and we might blame ourselves, that since we propagate stig stigmatizing messages about people going to therapy, then they can't go to a therapist. If they had uh, a broken arm, they would go to a doctor. They don't have a problem with that. They, they can go to a physician. Why? Because we don't stigmatize going to a physician when you break your arm. When you're sad and you have attachment injuries through trauma and relational trauma through the generations, we stigmatize people who will go to therapy because they're weak or they're crazy or they're going to kill a bunch of people or whatever the stereotype is. And that's our fault as a society. That's not the royal family. That's not the royal family's fault. Yo 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 says, I remember when they got married, Megan and Harry, and everyone thought Megan was the luckiest woman in the world who fulfilled the princess fantasy and the Cinderella story. Weird to see what it has become. Yeah, uh, this sort of stuff that as a society we hold up as an ideal is often not ideal. Uh, we've seen a lot of examples of this. A lot of famous people will, their problems don't go away. They're not any happier. They might even be less happy. And yet that's what a lot of people aspire to is, you know, fame and power and attention and more followers on Instagram and, you know, excessive amounts of money. And it does not solve your problems. <laughs> You're still sad, potentially. You're still traumatized, potentially. You still have attachment insecurities, and those are much more fundamental to our happiness and well-being and our physical well-being than fame or money. Again, a, a little bit of money, meaning up to, say, middle income is helpful, meaning that if you are below the poverty line, then you are going to start seeing some negative effects. We've seen that in research to your health, to your well-being, because you're so scared. You're living paycheck to paycheck and you have a hard time finding health care, at least in the United States, you have a hard time getting child care, you have a hard time paying you know, for vacations or just time off or something. And so for below a certain level, income absolutely does affect your well-being. But once you get up past a certain level, anything beyond that is either no effect on your well-being, and we've studied this a lot. We've actually studied lot, lot, lottery winners and found out that for a lot of people, they actually are worse off because of the lottery. Uh, not only do it, they, you know, does it not improve your well-being, but it actually can uh, degrade your well-being in a lot of ways. Anyway, Peace says, let me get this straight. So Megan had no security. Her children were being mistreated. She's relentlessly bashed in the press, held hostage in the house. She has no keys, car, passport, or ID. Yeah, that was another detail that she said she didn't have access to her passport. I mean, whoa. Uh, she can't have friends. She can't speak freely. And she won't be getting paid. Is that what you're telling me? Cool. Then this palace can kiss me where the good Lord split me. Toodles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm guessing the royal family isn't for everyone. Um, okay, Brandon and Julia videos. Let's get into that. Lots of stuff to get into with them today. Liz uh, emailed in, actually, and said, you can click on the email. There's a link below if you want to email uh, us directly. Liz says, 
Complete speculation, but I think Brandon has a lot of anxiety because Julia was upset with him. Complete speculation, but I think Brandon, so when Brandon was upset uh, with Julia and the wedding, uh, because you know Julia was upset at him for not having energy and enthusiasm about the wedding. Complete speculation, but I think Brandon has a lot of anxiety because Julia was upset with him about the wedding. And instead of admitting to his feeling, he attacks her and just makes stuff up because he has no legit reason to be angry. And to justify that he was angry, he is also pretending she is trying to change him. Maybe he is copying the coping strategy of his mom. Yeah, I, I think that's a very sound speculation. I think that, uh, again, just to uh, reiterate what you're saying here, Liz, is that if you were denied the ability to think for yourself and you have a really hard time even knowing what you want and you don't even know you don't know what you want, that's one of the problems with this dependency condition is that the individuals, because they've always been this way, they don't know that there's something different about them. They, they only realize it's sort of like when you have ADHD and you're a, you're a five-year-old, you know, you're running around and it's hard to stay on task. And then everyone's yelling at you all the time, like, sit down, stop, you know, and you're getting in trouble a lot, particularly when you start looking around to other kids, you think, wow, I'm, I'm getting, I'm in trouble a lot more than other kids. You don't know that you have an executive function problem. You just think there's something wrong with you, or you just wonder why is everyone reacting this way? I'm, I'm just being myself. And it's the same when you're a dependency personality. I don't know if Brandon is, but he has red flags of it, indications of it. And for those individuals, people will be yelling at you and saying, how come you're this way? Why are you doing this? Because other people assume that you are in connection with who you are, that you are in connection with what you want. And they will be yelling at you and, and saying, tell me what you want. And, and the dependent people of the world are just like, I don't understand why everyone's yelling at me. Will you please? I, I just want everyone to be happy. And we've heard Brandon say that a lot. And then when Julia is hurt, uh, understandably, that he seems to not care at all about the wedding. He doesn't remember why they had a wedding on that date. He doesn't know who's coming to the wedding. He seems like he, he's acting like he's a distant cousin who just happens to be there at the planning of the wedding. And she's very hurt by that. And he's like, oh, she's yelling at me. I don't, I don't know what to do. I'm scared, as Liz is pointing out. I'm scared of that rejection. I'm scared of losing her. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to attack. Oh, you're just trying to change me. You know, he's just grabbing at anything he can to push back and say, this isn't my fault. This is your fault. And Julia is even more hurt by that. To be able for, for Brandon to be able to say, oh, I understand where Julia is coming from. I see where she's coming from, that I am not exhibiting enthusiasm about the wedding and that's hurting her feelings. That's something that we see when we watch, but for him to be able to see that, especially in the moment, would be really hard because he has to recognize that there's a question mark about what he wants and he might not even know He's so distant from that question, he doesn't even know the question exists. Am I making any sense? <laughs> Let me know in the comments. Another Liz on YouTube said, this makes me feel like he has only, this makes me feel like Brandon has only been using the wedding as an excuse because for whatever reason, he doesn't actually want to move out. Right, I, I thought the same thing, Liz. I, I was wondering if, because on, on one hand, he was like, we can't move out because of, I need to save up for a wedding. And then when it came time to actually get married, now he's like, well, let's live at home or let me, let me sabotage the wedding so that I can stay home with my parents. A lot of this is probably unconscious. Uh, who knows? But it, there certainly seems to be some inconsistency with his approach, would, which would point to a dependency and an unconscious, pervasive personality of dependency where – he actually doesn't believe he can do things on his own, and, and he actually subconsciously desperately want to st wants to stay home in, with his parents because he, on one hand, wants, needs his parents to control him because he doesn't believe he can do things on his own, and at the same time resents it. A lot of people will do this in the form of self-sabotage. You might even know someone like this. You might actually be someone like this who you look back on your life and you just see a series of moments where 
you were the problem or the you know the individual self sabotaged their life they they just repeatedly would make these terrible errors and be stuck in a certain spot in life perpetually and it's easy to look at those people and say like what's wrong with you but if you're raised in a certain way one you don't have the ability to check in with yourself figure out what you need have the ability to listen to other people really well because no one really showed you that. The other thing is, is you don't believe you can do anything on your own. You just, you just don't believe. And when you truly do not believe you can do things on your own, then you'll figure out some way, unconscious or conscious, to push yourself back into dependency. Anyway, Calderon says, damn it, Brandon, I even remembered why you're getting married that day. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does point out, it's like, wait, if a bunch of randos watching a TV show remember why you're getting married on the 9th of May and you don't remember, like it's it's complete, it, it, it was one, it's one thing if he was like, oh yeah, that's, sorry, that's right, uh, if, if he just had a, a brain fart, as we call him in the moment. But he seemed to be saying, I don't know, I, th- I, I don't know, she has a lucky number, who knows? You know, as if, again, he's a distant cousin who heard a rumor about why they were getting married on May 9th and it's not personal to him. The way he came across in that episode was, was really interesting to me. The Saiyan says, I, so sometimes I ask people, comment below, tell me about your culture because the, the church people in the were, were like, oh, you're getting married Mother's Day weekend? Whoa, I don't know about that. I have concerns about that. And I was like, okay, we have Betty and we have the church people. Is this a cultural thing? The saying says, I live in Virginia and that is not a cultural thing over here. Getting this upset over, over a wedding happening the same weekend is absurd. Acme commented on this. The Mother's Day thing is an issue because many churches celebrate Mother's Day. Okay. Interesting. I always like to learn those kinds of things. Brittany says, my whole thing is Brandon doesn't have to be excited about the wedding planning, but he should be excited about marrying her. Right. I think Julia would agree with that. Mbot said, I am an only child raised by a single parent who has a dominant overbearing parent. Sorry, I read that (laughs) funny. I am an only child raised by a single parent who was dominant and overbearing. I was lucky to have been able to move out of the house at 18, at which point I began a long process of finding my voice. I can relate to Brandon a lot. The scene at the dress shop when Betty said, speak to Brandon, was triggering for me. I can't tell you how many times I heard that as a young adult. Speak. I just wanted to be invisible. I'm 37 now, and I, and I am still working on knowing who I am and what I want and how to communicate. I'm finally in a healthy romantic relationship. I still think Brandon is the worst, and I hope Julia runs for the hills, but I also hope he is able to get some distance from his parents and gets a good therapist. It can be healed for sure. Totally agree, Embot, and thank you for speaking your voice. It's wonderful that you're doing that. You're speaking your voice about how in the past you were not allowed to speak your voice. And so you're a therapist and you worked really hard on that. And that's really great. And I, I think the same thing for Brandon. There's a way out of this. It takes a long time, but it's there's a way out for sure. Jane says, I wonder if Brandon gave the reason of the wedding date being Julia's favorite number is a way of shifting the blame and criticism towards her as per usual. Yeah. Paulina says, I've been raised to be a people pleaser. I remember the sadness and weird rage I felt for a long time when someone I cared about started asking me about my needs and preferences. I would just cry in confusion and feel so, so defective. Yeah, so Polina and Embot are both pointing out this thing of, uh, for the dependent people of the world, for what looks to be like Brandon, it's hard to know. When you're frustrated with them and you're just like, speak, tell me what's going on, especially when you're angry. To the people pleasers, to the dependent people of the world, to the people who have incompetent and pleasing schemas, meaning that they feel pervasively incompetent, pervasively like they need to please. When you're yelling at them, speak up. This is triggering to them to such a degree that they it makes them even less likely to speak. And you just repeat this over and over again and people end up feeling 
very scared, confused, and defective, as Polina is pointing out. So when Julia was confronting Brandon from the outside, we can relate to Julia and look at Brandon and say, what's going on? But there's a possibility that there's so much going on underneath all that for him that he is terrified and he's not aware of it. He doesn't know what to do. And he's just doing anything to try to save the situation for himself and, and maybe preserve the relationship. These kinds of dependency personalities, dependent personalities, don't emerge just kind of randomly. There's a, there's a lot of pain and a lot of oppression early in life that happens to children that results in it. It's, it's a really hard thing to, to deal with. And when, when you look at people who are dependent, it's, it's tempting to look at them as uh, stable people. When you look at Brandon, so I don't know about Brandon, but I've seen people like him who from the outside, you would say pleasant, nice, they get along with people, they're not volatile, they seem to have their life together. But under right underneath the service, surface is what uh, Polina and Ambot are talking about, of just like they're just trying to be invisible, they're in a constant state of anxiety of pleasing, they don't know who they are, they don't know how to communicate what they are, people are constantly yelling at them to communicate what they want, they don't even know where to begin. And yet from the outside, they look completely fine. And it's tempting, again, to look at them as if there's nothing wrong and it's just it's just one little dial that they need to switch one, one notch over when in fact there's a whole set of dials that need to be switched through therapy. Keegan says, I've, I've known plenty of men that care about their wedding day. Uh, yes, me included. I've also known plenty of women that don't care about it and are happy with the courthouse. Gender has literally nothing to do with it. Yeah, I mean, in terms of inherently, it has nothing to do with it. Culturally, we will program uh, different genders differently about what weddings are. How many young boy uh, fantasy cartoons are about getting married? How many young girl cartoons and fantasies are about girls getting married. You know, you got Snow White and you have, you know, Cinderella. And for boys, you have Luke Skywalker and, you know, and so it starts early and we've studied it. When you, t you, knew, you take a four-year-old, you take a sample of four-year-olds in the United States raised in various different households, they already understand that they are a particular gender and that they need to think a certain way and to think the other way is to be wrong. And so you're going to see this, these kinds of attitudes in people. I don't know if that's what's going on with Brandon uh, in terms of his programming. Maybe even if he wasn't programmed that way, maybe he just is just really could not care less. But as everyone is saying, it doesn't matter. OK, fine. You don't care about the wedding, the ceremony. It's not your thing. Do you care about marrying your, the love of your life? <laughs> Do you, or what I was saying in the video is, do you care about Julia at all? You know, an analogy would be, let's say Julia is, I don't know, she's, do, you know, she's a dancer. Isn't she a dancer? So let's say Julia is doing a dance performance and Brandon really just does not care about dance. It's not his thing. He doesn't understand the art form. He just doesn't care. So Julia is going, it's my big night tonight. Would Brandon go like, I don't, or if she's like, hey, help me pick out an outfit. He's like, hey, don't ask me. I don't care. At the very least, and that's nothing like a wedding where you're actually having two people doing something. But at the very least, you would think someone would say, oh, I'm so excited. Yes, I'm on board. This, I see how much meaning you have in this. And so I, I'm, and I love you. And so I'm going to have uh, at least reciprocal or I'm going to have, I'm going to walk beside you as you have. And he doesn't even seem to be doing that, right? Again, to look at it from a surface point of view is Brandon is a jerk face. But when we understand personality, we can at least have some speculations as to why he, desperately he would turn to that behavior. Liz says, any, any compassion I had for Brandon dissipated drastically during the season. He's mocking his soon to be wife for crying. Yeah and he's being misogynistic. He might have trauma that caused him to be this way, but it's not an excuse for his behavior. Right, and I always want to be clear, and I don't know about Brandon, but sometimes people, because I have a, I don't know, a therapist point of view of things, which people might frame as being compassionate or understanding. And 
that's fine, but that doesn't mean that when we're being harmed by someone, when someone's being harmed, that that excuses it. It doesn't. When someone's being hurtful, even though I might be able to explain it like, well, the trauma and their emotional regulation, their differentiation level, their indoctrination into gender politics and their their mood, they, 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 lack, they didn't get enough sleep last night. There are reasons, but it doesn't excuse abusive, harmful, mean behavior towards others. It provides an explanation, but it doesn't, doesn't mean it's okay. And sometimes people even email it. Sometimes I talk about this, so this might be a repetition, but some people will say, my spouse is the way you describe certain people to be. And so I don't know what to do because I now, through your podcast, understand my partner better and have more compassion for them. But, I, but I'm being mistreated every day. So is it okay if I leave? And I'll say, if you want, for sure. In my life, I have, I, it, it, personal, in my personal life, there are people who are abusive to me and have, you know, I'm, I'm old, I, I, it happens. <laughs> Regardless of age, it happens. Like, you come across them and they, you know, and they target you and they hurt you. And, and so I've endured that. And in those moments, as a person, as a therapist, I will analyze them. And in my grief and sadness and anger, I, you know, I'll, I'll be angry and all the things, but then I'll take time to think, why would they be doing this to me? It can't be because of me, they're, they're, because they're, right? There's something about them that's making them do that. I'm guessing they do this to a lot of people. Depending on the situation, that, that'll be the conclusion I come to. And I might have a pretty compassionate point of view towards them. I will still avoid them. <laughs> I might still uh, back slowly out of the door uh, figuratively and try not to have any contact with them. I might literally cut them out of my life. So I can have compassion and I can have an understanding of them. And I can also have compassion for myself and say, I feel bad. And, and you know, sometimes I'll say there's someone in my personal life who has relational traumas where they go through a lot of abandonment. And because of that abandonment trauma, when I do anything that resembles abandonment, even if it's not anything like abandonment or rejection, they interpret it as abandonment. They get very hurt and then they get very angry and then they get very hostile with me. They get very demanding and controlling or dramatic or something. And I, I, I see it. I understand it. I get it. I, I've treated a lot of clients like that. So when I see it in my personal life, I can identify it pretty well. And I'm thinking, I don't want to be around that person anymore. So, you know, say this goes on for five years. I, so I can't. I just can't. And in that moment, I will know by me abandoning, because at this point, I am abandoning that person. And so I'll say, by me abandoning that person, I am adding to their trauma. That's not a light decision that I make, for sure, but I've made it. And I know that I'm not helping that person by doing that. But I also know I'm not helping myself by sacrificing myself for their well-being. And it's not their fault that they're the way that they are. It's their parents' fault or their caregiver's fault or something in their past that those other people are to blame. My, you know, the person in my personal life, it, it's, it's not their fault that they're like this, but it certainly isn't my fault either, right? And so if I'm being abused and I do all the mental calculations and I talk with everyone, my therapist, my friends, my wife about it, and I determine, yeah, I, I can't, There's, this is just too much, then I cut off. And I know that I not only do I have compassion for the person, but I also know by me pulling away, I'm actually going to add, I'm going to compound their traumas by, by this. I'm not abusing them by doing this. I'm just drawing boundaries. But, but I know they're going to interpret it as very hurtful, and it's, it's going to be another reason that they're not going to trust other people. And for me, in terms of my morality and my value system, that's okay with me. And so when I talk about having compassion, do not confuse that with self-sacrifice. All right, Mike and Natalie videos. Margaret says, the whole thing is just so hard and awkward to watch with Mike and Natalie. Mike is clearly done with the relationship. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> I'd certainly look that way to me, but maybe not. I mean, given the amount of walls that both of them put up, Mike in particular, it's easy for us to look at him and say he must not be invested in the relationship. But just because we can't see what's happening doesn't mean something isn't happening. 
So uh, when when he gave her the ring, I thought, what? I mean, I was very surprised. But at the same time, I thought, well, if I don't know what's going on behind those walls, then I shouldn't be surprised by anything going, going on. Anyway, Jasmine says, probably the first time I've sided with Natalie. I think she's frustrated. So I think this is the video where they're on the beach. Uh, I think Natalie is frustrated because she moved her entire life to a new country, but has no answers to whether or not they will move forward. I understand that Mike is probably and understandably upset about her behavior, though. Uh, Sweetie Dolan says, wait, did we miss Doc's birthday, Dr. Kirk's birthday? I thought he always said he was almost 50. If so, happy belated birthday, Doc. Yeah, I I'm 50. I turned 50. Uh, not too long ago, and um, thanks. <laughs> Sometimes I post on Instagram when it's my birthday, so you can join us on Instagram. Claire says, if he, uh, so we're talking about Mike and Natalie, if Mike doesn't forgive her, how can they move on? That would not work for me. Yeah, uh, true, but they have had no conversations that would facilitate him forgiving her. That's not on Natalie. It's not on Mike. It's on the two of them for not having many conversations at all about this. They, they have very brief conversations about it, and then they put the walls back up. They go to therapy once, and then they put the walls back up. Moving on from someone throwing the engagement ring in your face. Just imagine that for you people who are engaged or who are married, and you're in a big fight, and your spouse just, take, just takes off the ring and throws it at you. You're not going to forget that very quickly. That's going to be awful. That's that's not only like a rejection, but it's it's an aggressive like you know, and to throw a, a ring, you know, a ring. There's that's that's why we have these things. They're precious. They're there's so much meaning for a lot of people that get wrapped up in these pieces of metal, and it's very important. So uh, now I'm not saying that Natalie's wrong for wanting him to forgive. But that would be the process. If I worked with a couple like this, uh, working on that forgiveness would be something we would do. Maybe it would take one session. Maybe it would take 50 sessions. I don't know, but that would be something that we would want to work on. So we so we don't want to look and say Mike is okay to hold it over her head. And we don't want to look to Natalie and say it's okay for her to just demand that he apologize. What we'd want to do is the two of them to go down a road of recovery where there'd be a lot of open communication, a lot of feeling talk, which they have not done. Jovi and Yara videos, a couple of comments here. King says, I think we're seeing a truer, less stressed Yara. She's probably a lot sweeter than she often comes across. Yeah, very much could be. Certainly it starts to look that way. Twinkle says, as a parent who has, so in the videos from last week, we saw Jovi's mom was really hoping to be at the wedding and she was very sad that she wasn't invited. And a lot of people, at least it seems on the internet, are on Yara's side and against the mom. And so Twinkle wanted to chime in with something that I think we could all learn from. As a parent who has been through all of this with my adult kids, it's really tough. You put all your effort into getting your kids to maturity with the least amount of damage from the outside world, and it's really difficult to step back and let your kids leave you. It hurts a lot. In fact, as a parent, letting them go is the most difficult thing you will ever do for them. Not all these parents are doing very, this very well, but I certainly understand how they are feeling. Yeah. I'm, you know, I don't know, but I think a lot of the people who watch these videos, at least comment, are on the younger side. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. But I love it when everyone from all the different walks of life, all the different cultural pockets, all the different perspectives can say, hey, I'm just over here saying I, I don't agree with the way this mom is doing it. But as a mother who has been through this, I know how she feels. I, I, I know where that's coming from. And as a as a therapist, that's something that I, I, I'm always trying to absorb because understanding other people's perspectives is critical, or at least having it in your mind of there, there are a variety of perspectives and really knowing that in your bones is important because if you don't recognize that, you don't even know what questions to ask. You don't question your own perspective and your own bias. 
not only for that, but also as a professor, when I would, as I teach trainees, a big part of what I do is I, I try to get everyone in the class to speak from their cultural pocket and their, and their experience. Because I have mine, but all these students have theirs as well. And so you don't want to just hear from me. You got to hear from everyone. And so I'll, I'll often facilitate that. Okay, everyone speak from their space so that everyone and, and everyone else listen to that. And so Twinkle is providing us with that of just a, of a, a frequent a, a voice that isn't frequently uh, heard or voiced, at least in the comment section around. It might look weird to you, but you know if you ever go through this and you're a mother and you have adult kids and and they are completely leaving you, which is of course what uh, is usually I mean not completely leaving, but you know they're moving on in life, and. You, you don't want to let go because you've spent your whole life loving them and protecting them. And you might even feel as a parent you're owed something. You're owed a little bit of respect. You're owed a little bit of of attention and love. Like, am I chopped liver over here? Come on. And so there's there's feelings there. And it's easy to look at a mother, Jovi and Yara, and be like, Mom, just move on in life. Let it go. What are you doing? You're trying to control everything. We're not going to say that Jovi's mom, as Tuiko said, did everything right, but we can relate to the feeling. And that's what I hope you can always get from this channel is an opportunity to consider other perspectives, to consider other people's feelings, because we all deserve that. We really, really do. And take care of yourself because you deserve that as well. And tune in next time when I do some more things and then you comment below and then I comment on your comments next week. All right. Take care because you deserve it. You do.